here with the point God himself, man, let's go right into it. Like, why do you have the right? What makes you credible enough to talk to trainers and share your experience and give any advice if you are going to give your advice? Why are we talking right now? Well, man, you know, I've, I've been blessed, man, to, to be part of high level basketball, you know, going back to the grassroots level, um, played in high school um, for East Boston High School, which um, is one of the historically best programs in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, was able to win a state championship as as a freshman and play um, with a player, Will Blaylock, who, who ended up getting drafted by the Pistons. Um, I then had the opportunity to play out in prep school um, at Trinity uh, High School, in Manchester, New Hampshire, um, with uh, with some of the top players in the area. I was ranked the number one player in the state in 2010. Um, Chris Brickley, who was probably the uh, most famous basketball trainer um, in the world right now, um, had an honor to play with him. He was a freshman. Um, he was my backup point guard. Um, and then I walked on at, at Coppin State University, played for the great thing Mitchell as a small uh, HBCU Division One um, out in Baltimore. Um, then I had an opportunity to, to play for, for various uh, minor league and, and professional teams. Uh, both overseas and here in America. Um, since since uh, I retired from playing professionally full time, uh, you know I've trained probably about a thousand different players all over the country, um, including top grassroots players like Elijah Fisher, um, YouTube Dunk Sensation Guy Oliver, um, a kid who actually lived with me for about ten months. Um, you know, as well as other NBA, G League, um, top college and, and overseas guys. Um, you know, so, you know, between my, my playing experience, um, my training experience, I actually even owned a pro team back in Boston. I actually owned an ABA team with, with, uh, with professional guys. I was a uh, owner and player. Um, so I've, I've been around the game, um, on all levels. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that has given me the authority to speak on, on grassroots youth basketball training and development. And you're pretty passionate about. You know, you played overseas, you played professionally in the style of basketball, especially with the Olympics going on right now. You're pretty passionate about the way that they play basketball versus the way that the Americans typically play basketball and the style of training at the grassroots level. Why are you so passionate about that? And what are the adjustments and the changes from basketball specific training that you see that you think should be made? You know, I think, you know, obviously, you know, we see, we watched the Olympics, obviously USA did end up winning, but they had some struggles early on. It's not the first time um, that, that the USA team has had struggles um, with overseas teams. And, you know, I think it really comes down to the grassroots development um, where the focus in Europe is on fundamentals. The focus is on team play, uh, offensive strategies, moving without the ball, um, advanced kind of offensive type of actions. But, here in America, um, from the grassroots level, the focus is more on one-on-one -on -one play, individual play, uh, you know, highlight moves, um, and, you know, just playing up and down um, and, and not really, um, you know, really breaking the game down. And the reason why I'm so passionate about it is because, you know, not, not only does it, you know, in a broader scale, um, you know, uh, keep kind of American basketball um, from being as dominant in the past. I mean, that's at a, at a high level, but at the grassroots level for, for normal boys and girls looking to maximize their basketball opportunities, many um, through the training, through the AAU, are never really given the potential to reach their, their, full, their full capabilities. Um, a lot of talented kids, especially in the inner city, who really would benefit from the opportunity to play in college or use basketball as a vehicle um, for, for personal growth. Um, are not given the, the the proper teaching and fundamentals that that they can add to the already existing town or, or athleticism or, or whatever you call it to get them those scholarships, um, you know, and, and teach them to play the game the right way, um, you know. So that's why I'm so passionate about it. Um, and, and and above all, um, you know, I think the way that grassroots basketball in America is today not only does it damage players, you know, it damages kids, it damages their self esteem, their confidence this sense of worth um, and, you know, mix something that's supposed to be fun in a game um, to something that many times is, it's more about money and, and power and, and, and business. So how do you, that's tough though, because youth sports is a, a billion dollar industry. There's a lot of entertainment when it comes to the professional basketball 
and overseas and and domestically. How do you? What are some of those immediate changes, specifically when it comes to AAU? Because I mean, I know a lot of people like to throw stones at AAU, but you've got some thoughts uh, in regards to it too. After having your own team, after your own experiences there, where how would you train that? Let's go with the training industry first, because that's where we are, that's where you are, and yeah. you do do it for profit, right? You're not there right. to just just do it for fun, right? right. When that used right. to be the case with coaches spend time after practices, but let's start with the training industry first in terms of how you can change that. And then let's talk about AAU and how they, how it can change in that area. Well, first off the training industry is just completely oversaturated, right? Um, it's just like the AAU industry started. I think it started off with people who were qualified and really were passionate about training um, and, and wanted to make a career out, out of it. Um, to just an opportunity for anyone um, to make money. Um, so that's that's number one. Um, you know, I know where I'm at in Louisville, I mean, 95% of these trainers aren't qualified. They have no basketball resume. Like we talked at the top of the show, they have no background or resume um, to justify them um, training um, the next generation of players. Um, so that's number one. And only, and only reason they're in it is for to make some money, um, you know, to 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 feel a uh, feel a desire in their heart to be involved in a game of basketball that um, they couldn't be involved with as a player because they didn't work hard enough, they made the wrong choices, they weren't good enough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, secondly, then we got so second to piggyback off that is is because many of them are unqualified, <clears throat> they don't understand the process of player development, right? So they're just throwing out a whole bunch of girls out there, stuff they see online, you know, different step backs or different fancy moves they see, they may see on the highlights. And this is the basis of their training, right? They're not breaking down each individual player, figuring out their strengths and weaknesses, really breaking down and doing the boring stuff. Like, you know, if you got to teach a kid to, to, to fix their shot, you know, you're going to be doing form shooting right in front of the hoop. And, and at times it can be boring. It can be uh, challenging. Um, it can be frustrating for both the player and the coach, uh, but you got to be willing to give your true player development coach. You have to do the stuff that's not going to get you on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok. Um, and many of them don't do that. They only want to do the stuff that they see on Instagram, on social media, and they want themselves to be seen training players to do the same thing. Um, so many times you get players who know how to play 5% of the game because one-on-one -on -one basketball, fancy moves, stuff you do with the ball, that's 5% of the game. Do you know different, do you know all the reads coming off the pin down? Do you know all the all the reads at the ISO pick and roll? Do you know how to score on the pick and roll? Do you know how to put your defender in jail? Uh, do you know how to score off a dribble handoff, right? Now, all the all the one-on-one -on -one moves that you're taught, yes, you can use them within those situations, but if you don't understand the reads uh, and the reactions, then it's useless. Um, and, you know, going against cones and taking the same shot 10 times in a row and, 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 you know, again, it's, 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 it's a, it's, it's a, uh, what they call it a armchair quarterback approach to training because these guys are not fully committed to training. It's just a hustle for them. So then 30 as a, I thoroughly as a byproduct of all of this, right. Um, then the kids have a warped sense of what basketball is about, because if they see all these trainers doing these fancy moves and those are the trainers that they're going to gravitate to, um, especially if that trainer got, you know, got a hookup where he got video, good videographers coming, making fancy videos, cool videos, they're social media experts. So they got a lot of followers, a lot of viewers. The kids will go and be like, man, I just, I'm going to go train with them just so I can be get a, a fancy video. Um, especially in Louisville, there's, there's, these kids, they really don't want to work. Um, you know, my reputation for training is you're going to get a, a real hard NBA level workout as much as all these kids say they want to go to the NBA. You know, they don't want nothing to do with um, the stuff that I'm doing um, because I'm going to get you better. They want they want the, the, the fancy stuff. And, it, you know, it doesn't make sense. But the parents too, the parents fall into it, too. I know parents who bring their kids to certain trainers simply so that they can take photos and post on social media and, and get a video and 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 and. and you know, to them, that's another form of exposure. It just kind of bleeds, the AAU part kind of bleeds into that. Um, so, like I said, it's all those factors that leave kids, one, with an undeveloped game and a warped sense of what the game is about. Um, and then, you know, a warped sense about reality, man, is, you know, anybody can go and 
make a cute highlight tape and you can edit out all the misses and turnovers and all those mistakes. And you can think that you're somebody that you're not. Um, and, and, and that's very dangerous. So that, that, that's what I feel about as it relates to the training side. So that's interesting. You, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a connection I haven't really made before with parents thinking the pictures and the photos they take in training sessions are a, a carry on of exposure from AAU. Like I didn't, I didn't correlate those two together and it makes sense. I can definitely see that you're pretty opinionated. You have mentioned you've gotten banned off of Facebook at times with your opinions and Instagram. I don't, I don't think so, but I'm sure you've communicated this to parents, the players, the chase, the stats, not the clout, right? right. Are they in your areas being Kentucky, being a big basketball state, are they receptive to that message? Um, Yes and no. I mean, I think, um, you know, I mentioned I do a lot of training, um, you know, in Kentucky. I live in Louisville. I do have Louisville clients, but I go to surrounding counties and the surrounding counties and cities. Um, they're much more receptive to it. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of the issue with Louisville is because of the, the adults and I guess so the basketball, the youth basketball gatekeepers um, because they're corrupt, because they're their intentions are, are, are messed up. You know, a lot of this stuff kind of carries over. Um, you know, I think the players that really are dedicated to being good and the families that see the importance of that and see the importance of, okay, before I get exposure from my kid, let me get him good so he's not exposed, right? They get that, but again, many don't. But you got to realize, I mean, how many, how many of these kids, what's the statistics for the NBA? You know, out of high school kid, you know, 2.3.5% make it right so you know my market in my niche is that 3.5 percent that's going to make it the vast majority are going to do the wrong thing and that's why the vast majority don't make it the vast majority are going to put their all the emphasis on aau basketball fancy videos and that stuff and their kid is is not going to make it um the other 3.5 percent is going to put on focus on making sure your kid is becomes an elite player um with strong fundamentals and IQ. And those are the kids that'll get us college scholarships. Um, those are the kids that we see, um, you know, and, and again, I'm not against AAU. If you're an elite player, man, go out there and play. If you're an elite player, man, the camera should follow you. If you're coming down, scoring 30 points a game, dunking on people, hey, more power to you, keep it coming. But if you're averaging eight points a game playing AAU, you probably need to spend a little bit more time working with a trainer and getting your game together. That makes sense. That makes sense. And what are you, I guess, any, any other thoughts in terms of the, the business model with AAU in and of itself? I see what you're saying in terms of you get your game right, have sound, have sound fundamentals, and make sure you earn the stats and earn the right to be, uh, to have some good exposure, to not get exposed. I, I understand that part. What were your thoughts? Because I believe there was a post on social media that we had that you commented on with the argument against AAU in regards to the business model in conjunction with training? Like, why don't you pair those two together? And if you have done it, what went wrong? Well, well, what happened was I got involved with a guy. Um, I was doing training first um, with the program and then he wanted me to coach a couple of teams. So I was coaching the teams and, you know, he wasn't being forthright with the parents and families about the money. How he was doing it was, is, you know, he told them, well, you know, we need, let's say, $500 for X, Y, and Z. Okay. Parents pay $500. And two weeks later, he's like, well, we need another $250 for this. And, and then, so then now the third time is, now it's mandatory training. And so it's $200 per person, right? So, or, or whatever it was. So now what happened was is people started to get all pissed off because, you know, they, they, they keep asking for money. He's not letting people know all up front what it was. So that ended up turning people against me and, and kind of rebelling against training with me. So that was the first thing that kind of was like, man, you know, maybe I should have just stuck to the training because I started losing, losing clients because of how the guy kind of tried to force the training on them. Um, and then secondly, what I found is, is that, is that I had my own AAU program and I found that kids were uh, kids would come to train, right? But they weren't interested in training. They just wanted to be on the AAU team, right? And so, some things had happened um, where I would AAU team, I, you know, it was COVID and things just didn't work out. And then, you know, I ended up having 20 kids, uh, you know, working out with an extra 10 to 12 kids a week. 
And now because AAU didn't work out, now those kids, they don't answer your call, you the Texas um, and, and things like that. So I think the, you know, the, for the most part, most AAU programs say that they do training, right? Um, but it's really not training. Um, it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's just kind of, you know, some, some retired old drills, um, you know, you know, then they probably end up scrimmaging a little bit. Um, and, and they're not, it's not player development. And I think a lot of these kids are going to AAU expecting that. So when you try to, you're trying to put a, you're trying to put a, a, a round object into a, into a square, a square hole. Um, and many times, unless you can get a team of kids who are all committed to the, to the process, you know what I mean? To the, to, of, of, of the full process, which includes player development and exposure. This, this, that's the, this, you can't have one without the other. So I'm not speaking against AAU and saying don't have it. What I'm saying is, is that because it's become a money-making operation for many, or it becomes a, a, something that, let's say, my son is not good enough to make the local teams, right? And I don't want to admit that instead of going to get some training so he is good enough, I go make my own team. And then I go find six or seven other kids to use to play on a team with my son for, for, to try to elevate my child. Um, so you see that too. So when you get all those factors in it, um, you know, when you're trying to do training the right way, um, it almost becomes a, a, a hindrance than, than a help. No, that makes sense, man. And that that's that's pretty interesting. It it, it does really uh, pervert the numbers. It makes them look something like something they are, but they really aren't. So to your point, whenever the AAU season ends, it's like those kids go away. You don't have that on monthly recurring anymore. They right. don't want to train at all with you because they were just there to play in the first place. And right. it makes your numbers look completely different. And I've, I've experienced that as well. And I'm curious to know if anybody's doing that out there who's listening to this interview, if you've done something like a, to your point, if you have kids who are somewhat committed, but, you know, halfway committed, interested in it, I'm curious to know if anybody out there has done a, a full year AAU program where you charge on a monthly basis, but it's a year long commitment where they know that they're on that team. I'm curious if anybody's had success with, with doing that, that's listening to this, but uh, Mr. Point God, yourself is there anything else that you would like to share with the the crew the audience listening on the podcast in the live or wherever they may be listening man you know, i always say and this is for, for for other trainers um who are looking to get involved in the industry who are already involved in the industry you know i learned this from the great gannon baker is not to get caught up in those social media numbers um many many other trainers got a lot more uh you know followers than gannon um, but, you know, a lot of people don't realize that pretty much every big trainer that you see on Instagram uh, started with Gannon Baker um, and he put them on. And it gave me a perspective to realize that, man, and, and to share with other trainers is that, man, just keep perfecting your craft. Keep getting players better. All right. The social media stuff is cool. You may decide you want to hire, you know, like you say, you had a TikTok person or you may want to try to get some outside help to help further your social media in terms of your advertising and marketing. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to do so and I've declined. And, you know, my thing is, man, I just I, I, I believe that one day the world will catch up to how good I am. And I encourage other trainers um, to feel the same way, man. Just keep working, be the best you can. Keep getting yourself out there. Keep giving, keep getting, getting success. Success in the training industry is based on the plays that you develop, not the plays that you train. All right. So develop great players. All right. And when people will start to see it. And eventually everybody will catch up, man. So I just I just want to give people that encouragement um, and just just be a student in the game, man. Immerse yourself in the game of basketball. Don't cheat these kids, man, because you went the same way that you had a dream of making it. They have a dream. All right. And we are blessed to be in an opportunity that maybe a lot of us didn't have in our era because this didn't have this training industry where we can really, really be impactful and be a blessing to a player's basketball career and ultimately their life. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's all I got. That's solid, man. Hey, again, thank you for coming on to the podcast and for sharing some of that wisdom, man. I know we're going to keep chopping it up on IG with the comments. And just, hey, stay in that feed, man. Let's have that real rap, man. I really do appreciate that, uh, that engagement. Yes, sir, man. I appreciate what you're doing, man. I love your questions, man. You're confrontational. 
um, with your questions and, 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 and obviously I'm confrontational. Um, and that's why I was, I was always attracted to what you're doing, man. You call it like it is. You ask the hard questions. You try to get the hard answers, man. So, you know, salute to what you're doing, man, for real.